Night, Section 5, Part 1 The summer was coming to an end. The Jewish year was almost over. On the eve of Rosh Hashanah, the last day of that cursed year, the entire camp was agitated and every one of us felt the tension. After all, this was a day unlike all others. The last day of the year, the word last, had an odd ring to it. What if it really were the last day? The evening meal was distributed, and especially thick soup, but nobody touched it. We wanted to wait until after prayer on the apple pats, surrounded by electrified barbed wire, thousands of Jews, anguish on their faces, gathered in silence. Night was falling rapidly, and more and more prisoners kept coming, from every block, suddenly able to overcome time and space, to will both into submission. What are you, my God? I thought angrily. How do you compare to this stricken mass, gathered to affirm to you their faith, their anger, their defiance? What does your grandeur mean? Master of the universe, in the face of all this cowardice, this decay, and this misery. Why do you go on troubling these poor people's wounded minds, their ailing bodies? Some ten thousand men had come to participate in a solemn service, including the Black Altesta, the Capos, the bureaucrats in the service of death. Blessed be the Almighty. The voice of the officiating inmate had just become audible. At first I thought it was the wind. Blessed be God's name. Thousands of lips reacted the benediction, bent over like trees in a storm. Blessed be God's name? Why, but why would I bless him? Every fiber in me rebelled. Because he has caused thousands of children to burn in his mass graves? Because he kept six crematoria working day and night, including Sabbath and the holy days? Because in his great might he had created Auschwitz, Birkenau, Buna, and so many other factories of death? How could I say to him, Blessed be thou, almighty master of the universe, who chose us among all nations to be tortured day and night, to watch as our fathers, our mothers, our brothers ended up in the furnaces? Praise be thy holy name, for having chosen us to be slaughtered on thine altar? I listened as the inmate's voice arose. It was powerful yet broken, amid the weeping, the sobbing, the sighing of the entire congregation. All the earth and universe are gods. He kept pausing as though he lacked the strength to uncover the meaning beneath the text. The melody was stifled in his throat. And I, the former mystic, was thinking, yes, man is stronger, greater than God. When Adam and Eve deceived you, you chased them from paradise. When you were displeased by Noah's generation, you brought down the flood. When Sodom lost your favor, you caused the heavens to rain down fire and damnation. But look at all these men whom you have betrayed allowing them to be tortured, slaughtered, gassed, and burned. What did they do? They pray before you. They praise your name. All of creation bears witness to the greatness of God. In days gone by, Rosh Hashanah had dominated my life. I knew that my sins grieved the Almighty, and so I pleaded for forgiveness. In those days, I fully believed that the salvation of the world depended on every one of my deeds, on every one of my prayers. But now... I no longer pleaded for anything. I was no longer able to lament. On the contrary, I felt very strong. I was the ac accuser, God the accused. My eyes had opened and I was alone, terribly alone in a world without God, without man, without love or mercy. I was nothing but ashes now, but I felt myself to be stronger than this Almighty to whom my life had been bound for so long. In the midst of these men assembled for prayer, I felt like an observer, a stranger. The service ended with Kaddish. Each of us recited Kaddish for his parents, for his children, and for himself. We remained standing in the apple plats for a long time, unable to detach ourselves from this surreal moment. Then came the time to go to sleep, and slowly the inmates returned to their blocks. I thought I heard him wishing each other a happy new year. I ran to look for my father. At the same time, I was afraid of having to wish him a happy year in which I no longer believed. He was leaning against the wall bent shoulders sagging as if under a heavy load. I went up to him, took his hand, and kissed it. I felt a tear on my hand. Whose was it? Mine? His? I said nothing. Nor did he. Never before had we understood each other so clearly. The sound of the bell brought us back to reality. We had to go to bed. We came back from very far away. I looked up at my father's face, trying to glimpse a smile or something like it on his stricken face. But there was nothing not the shadow of an expression. 
defeat. Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Should we fast? The question was hotly debated. To fast would mean a more certain, more rapid death. In this place, you were always fasting. It was Yom Kippur year-round. But there were those who said we should fast, precisely because it was dangerous to do so. We needed to show God that even here, locked in hell, we were capable of singing his praises. I did not fast. First of all, to please my father, who had forbidden me to do so. And then, there was no longer any reason for me to fast. I no longer accepted God's silence. As I swallowed my ration of soup, I turned that act into a symbol of rebellion, of protest against him. As I nibbled on my crust of bread, deep inside me, I felt a great void opening. The SS offered us a beautiful present for the new year. We had just returned from work. As soon as we passed the camp's entrance, we sensed something out of the ordinary in the air. The roll call was shorter than usual. The evening soup was distributed at great speed, swallowed as quickly. We were anxious. I was no longer in the same block as my father. They had transferred me to another commando, the construction one, where twelve hours a day I hauled heavy slabs of stone. The head of my new block was a German Jew, small with piercing eyes. That evening he announced to us that henceforth no one was allowed to leave the block after the evening soup. A terrible word began to circulate soon thereafter. Selection. We knew what it meant. An SS would examine us. Whenever he found someone extremely frail, a muscleman was what we called those inmates. He would write down his number. Good for the crematorium. After the soup, we gathered between the bunks. The veterans told us, You're lucky to have been brought here so late. Today this is paradise compared to what the camp was two years ago. Back then, Buna was a veritable hell. No water, no blankets, less soup and bread. At night, we slept almost naked and the temperature was 30 below. We were collecting corpses by the hundreds every day. Work was very hard. Today, this is a little paradise. The capos back then had orders to kill a certain number of prisoners each day. And every week, selection. A merciless selection. Yes, you are lucky. Enough! Be quiet! I beg them. Tell your stories tomorrow or some other day. They burst out laughing. They were not veterans for nothing. Are you scared? We too were scared, and at that time, for good reason. The old men stayed in their corner, silent, motionless, hunted down creatures. Some were praying. One more hour, then we would know the verdict. Death or reprieve. And my father? I first thought of him now. How would he pass selection? He had aged so much. Our Block El Testa had not been outside a concentration camp since 1933. He had already been through all the slaughterhouses, all the factories of death. Around nine o'clock, he came to stand in our midst. Achtung! There was instant silence. Listen carefully to what I am about to tell you. For the first time, his voice quivered. In a few moments, selection will take place. You will have to undress completely. Then you will go, one by one, before the SS doctors. I hope you will all pass but you must try to increase your chances. Before you go into the next room, try to move your limbs. Give yourself some color. Don't walk slowly. Run. Run as if you had the devil at your heels. Don't look at the SS. Run straight in front of you. He paused and then added more. And most important, don't be afraid. That was a piece of advice we would have loved to be able to follow. I undressed, leaving my clothes on my cot. Tonight, there was no danger that they would be stolen. Tibby and Yossi, who had exchanged commandos at the same time I did, came to urge me. Let's stay together. It will make us stronger. Yossi was mumbling something. He probably was praying. I had never suspected that Yossi was religious. In fact, I had always believed the opposite. Tibby was silent and very pale. All the block inmates stood naked between the rows of bunks. This must be how one stands for the last judgment. They are coming! Three SS officers surrounded the notorious Dr. Mengele, the very same who had received us in Birkenau. The Block El Testa attempted a smile. He asked us, Ready? Yes, we were ready. So were the SS doctors. Dr. Mengele was holding a list, our numbers. He nodded to the Block El Testa. We can begin, as if this were a game. The first to go were the notables of the Block. The Steuben Altesta, the Capos, the foreman, all of whom were in perfect physical condition, of course. Then came the ordinary prisoners' turns. Dr. Mengele looked them over from head to toe. From time to time, he noted a number. I had but one thought. 
do not have my number taken down and do not show my left arm. In front of me, there were only Tibi and Yossi. They passed. I had time to notice that Mengele had not written down their numbers. Someone pushed me. It was my turn. I ran without looking back. My head was spinning. You are too skinny. You are too weak. You are too skinny. You are good for the ovens. The race seemed endless. I felt as though I had been running for years. You are too skinny. You are too weak. At last I arrived, exhausted. When I had caught my breath, I asked Yossi and Tibby, Did they write me down? No, said Yossi, smiling. He added, Anyway, they couldn't have. You were running too fast. I began to laugh. I was happy. I felt like kissing him. At that moment, the others did not matter. They had not written me down. Those whose numbers had been noted were standing apart, abandoned by the whole world. Some were silently weeping. The SS officers left. The Block El Testa appeared, his face reflecting our collective weariness. It all went well. Don't worry. Nothing will happen to anyone. Not to anyone. He was still trying to smile. A poor, emaciated Jew questioned him anxiously, his voice trembling. But, sir, they did write me down. At that, the Block El Testa vented his anger. What? Someone refused to take his word? What is it now? Perhaps you think I'm lying? I'm telling you, once and for all, nothing will happen to you. Nothing. You just like to wallow in your despair, you fools. The bell rang, signaling that the selection had ended in the entire camp. With all my strength, I began to race toward Block 36. Midway, I met my father. He came toward me. So, did you pass? Yes, and you? Also. We were able to breathe again. My father had a present for me, a half ration of bread, bartered for something he had found at the depot, a piece of rubber that could be used to repair a shoe. The bell. It was already time to part, to go to bed. The bell regulated everything. It gave me orders, and I executed them blindly. I hated that bell. Whenever I happened to dream of a better world, I imagined a universe without a bell. A few days passed. We were no longer thinking about the selection. We went to work as usual and loaded the heavy stones onto the freight cars. The rations had grown smaller. That was the only change. We had risen at dawn, as we did every day. We had received our black coffee, our ration of bread. We were about to head to the workyard as always. The Block El Testa came running. Let's have a moment of quiet. I have here a list of numbers. I shall read them to you. All those called will not go to work this morning. They will stay in the camp. Softly, he read some ten numbers. We understood. These were the numbers from the selection. Dr. Mengele had not forgotten. The Block El Testa turned to go to his room. The ten prisoners surrounded him, clinging to his clothes. Save us! You promise! We want to go to the depot! We are strong enough to work! We are good workers! We can! We want! He tried to calm them, to reassure them about their fate, to explain to them that staying in the camp did not mean much and had no tragic significance. After all, I stay here every day. The argument was more than flimsy. He realized it and, without another word, locked himself in his room. The bell had just rung. Form ranks! Now it no longer mattered that the work was hard. All that mattered was to be far from the block, far from the crucible of death, from the center of hell. I saw my father running in my direction. Suddenly I was afraid. What is happening? He was out of breath, hardly able to open his mouth. Me too. Me too. They told me too to stay in the camp. They had recorded his number without his noticing. What are we going to do? I said anxiously. But it was he who tried to reassure me. It's not certain yet. There's still a chance. Today they will do another selection, a decisive one. I said nothing. He felt time was running out. He was speaking rapidly. He wanted to tell me so many things. His speech became confused. His voice was choked. He knew that I had to leave in a few moments. He was going to remain alone. So alone. Here, take this knife, he said. I won't need it any more. You may find it useful. Also take this spoon. Don't sell it. Quickly, go ahead. Take what I'm giving you. My inheritance. Don't talk like that, father. I was on the verge of breaking into sobs. I don't want you to say such things. Keep the spoon and the knife. You will need them as much as I will. We'll see each other tonight, after work. He looked at me with his tired eyes, veiled by despair. He insisted. I am asking you, take it. Do as I ask you, my son. Time is running out. Do as your father asks you. Our capo shouted the order to march. The commando headed toward the camp gate, left, right. I was biting my lips. My father had remained near the block, leaning against the wall. Then he began to run to try to catch up with us. Perhaps he had forgotten to tell me something, but we were marching too fast, left, right, 